is the Director of Engineering and Standards at SEMTI. And I will let you... Exactly. Okay, fantastic. Yep. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, it's been a long week, <clears throat> so pardon me if I drift off right in the middle of the speech. Um, we've had this little conference going on, a little gala tonight. So anyway, um, I am Howard Luck, as it says. Our agenda today, I'm going to cover it relatively fast and go through this. I see a lot of familiar faces here that are familiar with SEMPTI. So uh, we'll talk about how I got involved with CompCine, because I'm a big fan of this stuff. So I'm really happy to see this, this happening today. And then we're going to take a look at the quick standards overview and then look at stereoscopic, which kind of leads it. And again, terms are very important. We'll talk a lot about that as we go forward. And then what I call comp cine standards, because that's how I've known it, it's computational cinematography. So give it a name. When we do our standards efforts, one of the biggest things we always wrestle with is we always go about five to 10 to 15 meetings with everybody calling the same thing something differently. So the first thing we have to do in standards efforts is make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So Basically, I've termed it from what Mark Lavoie started back in Stanford, which kind of got a lot of this stuff going, is computational cinematography or comp cine. So not necessarily light fields, but this is a whole process to get everything from the start to the end as far as cinematography goes. Now, there's other issues to talk about as far as medicals. So how did I get in it? Well, let's talk about how I did this. And there's a couple of people in the room. I see Daniel walked out. I think he has some gray hairs from from this experience that we did. Uh, we started working with what HHA Fraunhofer had started in Berlin, which was the trifocal camera. Uh, and we saw a couple of demonstrations. You can see our little prototype on the, on the left there that got started and then eventually turned into, with the help of Ari and HHI, uh, into a trifocal camera system. You can kind of see the little cameras around there. This was designed specifically to do movies and movie making. And the goal was, as we went and did 3D, uh, we had a hard time getting cameras aligned, all the physics, the lenses, everything tracking. And if you put uh, 10 cameras on a shoot for a concert like we did for Hannah Montana, I started thinking there's got to be a better way of doing this. Is there any way that we can do this? We don't have to fight the physics of the camera rigs. And so the concept of computational cinematography caught my eye and we started thinking, could we use those two small cameras on the side to actually capture uh, the depth information on set, let the cinematographers concentrate specifically on the center camera and their work, and then make uh, stereoscopic on the back end, which is why it's called kind of hybrid 3D, if you will. Um, so we went to Berlin in August of 2013. We shot a little short called Make Believe, and one of the big form factors things we had to do was we had to get that thing onto a steady cam uh, because that's what you do when you make movies, is you always put something on Steadicam. So um, we did that. We had this poor gentleman here that uh, we set up the exact situation where we had a really small complex area that we had to shoot in, and we made sure that he could take that Steadicam around with that thing and get a 360, 100 degree view. So, and it actually worked, although that weight of that thing was like 45 kilos, I think. So the poor guy was, was really struggling through the whole shoot. Um, so let me go on to the next one. So that's enough about CompCine and how I got involved in it and how it kind of moves forward and got me actually excited about it. Let's talk about standards now. So in SEMPTI standards, for those that aren't familiar with standards, we have a range of standards. At the very top of the list is a standard. That's called using an ST. So there's names before numbers, ST. Uh, I've got, I think, what is it, uh, 2067 up there showing right now. We also have recommended practices. These are less stringent, if you will, just kind of recommending this is how you should do things, if you will. And then we have engineering guidelines, which are really a, a more of this is a way you could do some things and some more information for you. On top of that, we also do some things which are more like specifications, which is a registered disclosure document, which is RDDs. These are proprietary uh, basic uh, technology that's not really ready for a standard, uh, but a company wants to actually document this and keep this in a publication library. So we do this called a registered disclosure document. It has a lot less consensus body rules and due process around it to get it out the door. The standards have a lot of due process, same thing with the recommended practice, engineering guidelines. The other thing we do is what's called engineering reports, and this is probably the most interested to this group maybe at this point in time. A lot of these things are study reports. When we get a first brand new technology in, and we don't know what we want to do, we don't know where the gaps are, we want to do a gap analysis, we arrange what's called a study group. And that study group then looks at everything around a certain subject and then makes recommendations for going forward. What standards are we missing? What standards do we have? What standards do we need? And usually that's when the technology is starting to come out and be used in the industry. 
Otherwise, SEMTI's not really good at inventing things on their own. Uh, let's just put it that way. We're good at adopting and standardizing technology that's already out there in the field. We've done a couple of homegrown inventions, but it's been very painful. And probably a reason why Walt Ordway has all that white hair back there as well, too. Actually, that might have been DCI, but that might be another thing. Uh, the other thing we do is administrative guidelines. That's just kind of an internal housekeeping uh, thing for us to administrate. And then we do advisory notes. If we have a publication or a standard that went out and there's an error in there, we'll do an advisory note for that. Um, this is a kind of a flow chart. I have to do this. I'm an engineer and put up a little eye chart. This is kind of the process of how we start projects that then create these documents, if you will. I'm not going to hang a long time in this. And I don't know if these PowerPoints are going to be available after the fact for folks, but anyway, they'll, this won't be available. Uh, and then here's our standard. If you want to get a standard done, here's the flow chart of how it gets done. So a lot of people complain to us that we're slow, but we are a due process uh, organization. We have to go through this flow chart. I won't let you sit on this for too long because it'll make your mind a little crazy. But it works. We've, uh, we've actually published more standards this year than we have in the past 100 years. So being a 100-year-old company celebrating tonight, yay. Uh, and then this is for our registered disclosure documents, I believe. And this process, you can see it's a lot less onerous to get that through. A lot of companies will start with an RDD and then move it into a standard later once they get that done. Uh, it's all easy to check. And then here's the flow charts for the, the engineering guidelines, um, engineering reports, administrative guidelines, and advisory notes, which is not, not that much to do. Um, so let's talk about stereoscopic first. And again, we made it a, a clear decision to call it S3D and not 3D because there's a big confusion if you talk to creative folks when you say 3D. 3D to us is 3D models, 3D graphics, and things that are in there. If you're talking about displaying out to a human with stereoscopic 3D, then we call it S3D or stereoscopic 3D. This is where I say names are important and we like to give it a name. Um, so the current state, uh, basically, I want to walk through this because some of this stuff does apply to a certain area of what we have uh, and other things don't apply at all to the light field and, and the things that you guys are talking about. Um, transport is probably the biggest thing. Uh, again, an eye chart, I'm not going to go through each one of those, but we use SDI for the most part. Uh, that's been SEMPTI's kind of forte for quite some time now. It's getting maybe a little bit long in the tooth these days since everything's moving over to IP but we do have SDI to transport a lot of these things and a lot of those standards have been worked out all the way up to 12 gigs. So the gentleman that was looking for a transport mechanism and said he didn't have it for his 115 terabits, without coffee, I did a little back of the napkin calculating, we can do it with ST2082, which is the 12 gig links. You will need 9,584 of them, <laughs> but you can make it happen. So. The other thing we've done for stereoscopic is we've actually looked into disparity maps and depth maps. I won't go into detail what those are, but there is a lot of usage, especially in the creative side, of disparity maps and depth maps. Disparity meaning we're counting the distance between pixels. Depth maps meaning we're counting the relationship in distance and actually uh, absolute distance in some cases or relative distance for that matter. Um, there's two documents that are out there. The first one was done, actually brought in by Technicolor. It's the 2066. It talks about disparity maps. Uh, this is a great thing. It was really pointed a little bit more to the B2B transport out to the set-top boxes because it defines disparity maps only for fixed image resolutions. So it does 1920, 2048, 4096, those fixed integers, if you will, for disparity maps. Uh, and you can use that. It doesn't do anything with depth maps, so it doesn't create anything for absolute. It's just pixel disparity. The next one is 2087, which recently got published. This one does deal with both disparity and depth map, both. Um, one of the things we found out with a hybrid 3D effort that we did is if I created a disparity or depth map in a, in a foundry system, I couldn't take that over to somebody else's system. Everybody did their depth maps a certain way. One person would use foreground for black pixels. The other one would use foreground for white pixels. It goes back and forth. So we finally decided we should probably nail this down and have a, a standard about the, the depth maps. And so this one was just released. It uses a 32-bit, 16-bit floating point to calculate that. You can dive into that and learn more about that if you want. Um, so let's move on to comp cine standards that we have in, in, in SEMPTI. Uh, we don't have much, it's just saying. So it's, it's really early days. I decided that there's two things that we really need to do coming out of the hybrid 3D experience that we have to do, and that's talking about timing for cameras and synchronization and time code stamping, because we found that you know, as you bridge that prosumer and 
the actually academic side versus the actual um, industry side of making movies all the time. Time code is kind of a little bit of a vague thing. Um, so we really found it very, you know, uh, encouraging to kind of stamp these things. So there is a uh, RP2076, uh, again, it's a recommended practice, it's not a standard, on how to keep camera timing going together. Uh, and it works for either stereoscopic or multi-camera ways. So I'm really happy that we have a multi-camera array finally in a standard. So yes, we're going towards light field. Um, basically, it talks about the timing relationships and all those things. Again, I won't go into detail on that stuff. The second document that was done was a recommended practice. Actually, that's wrong. I made it. It's an EG, so I have to change that. It's actually an engineering guideline, which is 2076-2, which talks about a complete system, system timing, and all the rest of the stuff for stereoscopic or multi-camera arrays as you pump it through particularly as it concerns SDI. Now, in this document, it kind of capped it off at HD and 2K. It doesn't really go beyond that. Uh, but you can kind of apply the same principles, if you will, along to those things. So it tells you how to manipulate and how to get through the world of SEMPI standards and SDI standards and transport in all those places where you can take a hit in your synchronization of your images that will mess stuff up for you along that way. Um, so what's missing? Um, and again, I've run through this really, really fast. Um, these are the things that I could think of off the top of my head that really uh, needs to be worked on in the SEMPTI areas to make sure that we can handle these light field and comps, any things that are going forward. The biggest thing is identification and metadata to identify your single cameras in a camera ray, or if you want to identify your plenoptic, each one as a separate unit, there should be some way to identify that. Right now, we don't have that. We can identify left eye and right eye, and that's about as far as we go. So there needs to be some more work in the metadata schemes to get that stuff going. That's on the camera side, capture side. It also goes along for transport and recording. Uh, lens metadata, uh, what do you need and do you need lens metadata? Uh, you know, this is a new thing going for CENI and all that kind of stuff. You know, you got a plan optic lens, I don't think you need lens data. Uh, if you got a multi-camera right, maybe you need it, maybe you don't. Um, so that's a, that's a, and then location metadata, where was that camera at at the time that it captured that? That could be very important and useful for you. So that could be a good thing to do. We don't have location metadata per se in the standards that flows through a system as well either. Uh, recording, uh, yeah, 115 terabits a second coming at you, that's gonna be a tough thing to do. Um, so there's many different ways to, to do that challenge, but there's, there's no standardized method at I know that, that supports those data rates. Again, metadata. And then the other thing is time labels. Um, we've had 12M time code for such a long time. Uh, it's kind of running long in the tooth. It doesn't support any higher frame rates other than 60. Um, so that's an issue. We do have a new standard that came out, which is 12.3, which I kind of consider a band-aid to get you to higher frame rates. It actually works right now but it doesn't really relate to all the times and the time slices that you're gonna need. The best time granularity that we can get with 12M right now is one frame. Uh, you know, so that's in the milliseconds maybe at the most. Most, If you're trying to slice and do some R&D stuff where you really need precision, you're not gonna have those time labels and time stamps that you need. So there's some ongoing stuff that's going on right now. I'm hosting time code summits to the user community right now. Uh, around the world, um, going off to London uh, next week to do one there. We did one in Hollywood here. There's a time code survey on our website. I encourage any users to actually go to the SEMPTI website, SEMPTI.org slash timecode, and take that user survey. It'd be very, very helpful for us as we get the user requirements built up for the next time label system that's coming along. Um, SDI metadata, as I talked about before, uh, how to identify each one of these. If we use, uh, you know, 5,000 or 9,584 SDI streams, we should have a way to identify which stream is which cable when it comes out the other end electronically. Uh, and then uh, moving into IP or, uh, vi you know, studio video over IP, uh, another acronym for you. How do we get that essence uh, of light field into that pipeline as well, too, and also have the metadata that goes along with that? So those are the things that I've kind of identified. I'm sure there's a lot more stuff that we're missing in the SEMPTI standards world, and, and you know, one of the reasons to be here and talk about that and start getting some feedback on that stuff. So I encourage you um, to reach out to me, or best thing is become a SEMPTI member yourself and participate in our standards. Um, we tend to wait for a general swell of the industry on a technology before we start doing anything standardization. 
But I think seeing today that probably it's a good time to start thinking about maybe we should have a study group in SEMPTI for light field technology and multi-cam arrays and all that stuff going forward. So that's the end of my speech. Maybe we made up a little bit of time by speaking fast. So. So actually, that was my first question. Do you think it's time for uh, an engineering uh, report at this point? It sounds like you do. Yeah, I think so. I think it is time to now kick up a study group in SEMPTI to look at all of the things that are missing in the gaps and do the gap analysis and, and put out a report to the community. Yeah. yeah. It needs volunteers, though. We're a volunteer effort, so nothing gets done unless you show up. Um, so if you are uh, someone that is interested in this, I encourage you to show up at SEMPTI at the standards meetings. Uh, and again, if, you, if you're not aware of that, uh, you can ask me or there's plenty of information on the website as well, too. Is, is STI really something that we should be thinking about? I mean, that's... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it is useful and it's been the thing. So, uh, you know, STI has always been ahead of IP for as far as bandwidth goes for quite some time. Maybe that's not the case anymore. Uh, but you can multiplex SDI into optical. I didn't bring up those standards that we've got for that. They're still mm -hmm. working on some of those things. So you can conceivably maybe, uh, it might be a little rough at first, but use SDI or an SDI version format going through optical links to get you to where you need to go before the, the IP world catches up with uh, I don't know, 40 gig and 50 gig, whatever is coming next down that line. Well, I mean, 10, 10 gig is almost mainstream at this point. So, yeah, yeah, you know. it is. The one thing we do have in SDI is we don't have the overhead that IP does. So that is a good thing that, that you have with SDI versus IP and switches and things like that. So it's, it's good for point to point. Um, and great. So any questions? Certainly one of the themes today has been uh, high bit rate <coughs> transmission, massively parallel. Um, there was a talk from NHK. Is there anything we can learn from their experimental work in 8K transmission and broadcast in terms of hardware? And I, I think you can, you but, but 8K is a long way from the megapixel stuff that you guys are talking about. So I think you're probably way out in front of everyone else as far as the needs for bandwidth, both sure. transmission and recording. Um, so I think you're going to have to find those niches in the world that are working on these things. And, you know, I was interested in the, the satellite array. I hadn't known about the satellite folks and their, their arrays and what they were doing, so that was quite, quite mm. exciting to me. Mm. Yes? It's interesting that um, you seem to be, we don't have any connection in like Thunderbolt and getting good connectors to those sorts of Right, well, right. That I can do for the right now. Right, right. Yeah, those are proprietary interfaces that they've never really been motivated to bring them into SEMPTI for standardization. And, you know, of course, it's Apple. So we're, we're, well, Thunderbolt, is, yeah, is, is different than Apple. Thunderbolt, I mean, Apple uses that. But, um, and that's in IEEE. So it's really a balance with us between what comes into SEMPTI and what comes into IEEE. And then, of course, there's ISO, ITU, and JPEG. And we kind of try to work with each one of them and stay in our lane, if you will, for, for some of that stuff. That's the problem. Well, I know. And so having more, uh, a wider reach and attending more of these things and getting some cross-pollination is really what we need to do more of, to your point. Yeah. Well, this is a sort of a follow-on question to that one because it, it, uh, I just was thinking, you know, uh, SEMPTI has always called its swim lane the professional lane. Yeah. And now as we move to, uh, you know, IP and other technologies, we're starting to get to a point where there aren't really professional versus consumer lanes anymore. We're all working in the same space and overlapping and even HDR, it's really a mishmash of things from all kinds of places. So do you think that's a good idea that we stay in our own swim lane? And I, I'm not sure it's even, you know, I'm just asking, do you see a different future for how SEMPTI would work on these type of issues with other organizations? Yeah, I absolutely do because I think there's, you know, in, in what's happening from what I can see, there's a lot of consolidation that's already happened in media. You know, we've had the IT, we've been separate for a long time between IT and media for the longest time because dedicated hardware versus computer hardware. That's, that boundary is gone. It's completely obliterated right now. So, um, and we're trying to find our way of what gets done by ITEF, for example, IEEE uh, and W3C versus SEMPTI. And I think it's time to start looking that, you know, we, I, I see the same people at each one of the meetings now, mm. you know, and we're going to multiple, multiple meetings just to, to talk about the same subject all over. HDR is a perfect example of that. I don't know how many HDR 
groups there are right now. Yeah. And VR well, is yeah. going to be worse. And VR is going to be probably even worse, right? We'll have all these groups. And so we need to kind of consolidate that stuff together. Where is the home for that? It's a good question. I mean, SEMPTI could be. Um, but there's some things I think we need to change at SEMPTI. We're, we're, you know, we're 100 years old, so we've yeah. got we to figure out how to do the next 100 a years. Creaky. A little Maybe. creaky, and you know, so we, we're trying to change it. But. So, so I, would, I would suggest only that I, I understand and agree about IEEE and all these other folks, internet task force, et cetera. But you know, we are motion imaging, yes. and that's our thing. And whether it's now consumer or professional labels on the products, there may be more spreading of what's needed in that area than what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I've, I've seen some things that are very interesting with like the Netflix folks, because the Netflix went out and they did all the proprietary stuff and they started doing all this stuff. And then they found, oh my God, this is so painful because we have to get everybody to sign up for our proprietary stuff. Mm -hmm. So they've actually come back into SEMPTI in the fold and say, okay, we need to start standardizing some of this stuff. So I think that's what you, you always see that kind of flare out and then come back in again. And, you know, I believe we do have a lot of image experts at SEMPTI, and so it's a good home for a lot of this work to be done. Yeah. Well, the, the, there's one, one potential issue here is um, it, SEMPTI does not publish open standards. No, we do not at this moment publish open standards. But again, uh, we're looking at now, we have an effort to look at SEMPTI and where it needs to go for the next 100 years, and there's a lot of things on the table right now under consideration, so we'll see. But for the moment, yes, it's not open standards. You have to pay for the standards. Yeah. They are publicly available, but you have to pay for the standards. So. Right. Right. Which is a, yeah. 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 So I would say there's a difference between open and free. I think we have open standards, but they're not free. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Okay, thank you, Howard. Sure.